الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ولا وبعد أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله وصحابته ومن اتبع سنته بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد Last time we finished the explanation and application of the ayah اهدنا الصراط المستقيم and the type of guidance we should be seeking from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then tonight inshallah we're going to resume from ayah number 7 صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم this clear distinction as to what path Allah is teaching us that fits to be called as-sarat al-mustaqim, the straight path, it does have parameters. The parameters are, it is not the path of those that you, Allah, have sent down your wrath upon them. We know that Allah SWT told us in the Quran whom does he send his wrath upon. So the general definition is any ayah that says أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ لَعَنَهُمُ اللَّهِ or where he says, Ula'ika yal'anuhum Allah. Those are the ones that Allah is saying, it is not that path. So this is one side of the parameter. The other side, waladdalin. Nor is it the path of those who are lost, who are gone astray, which means away from the path of Allah. So these are the two parameters. In between the two is the straight path that we travel on to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where He likes us to be. Those two parameters show us the points of deviation that if you follow one of the two paths you start to deviate. If you start to see yourself drifting away, right or left, from the straight path, you are getting out of the parameters of the straight path. So one has to be careful too. So what do people do that Allah says that He has cursed? Let us define what is cursed, what is the wrath of Allah and what defines the curse? The curse is to be kicked out of the mercy of Allah. Who is the first creature that Allah told us? La'anahu Allah. Shaitan. Right? Iblis. The, the head shaitan. Of course, he is cursed and those who follow him will equally be cursed whether they are from his descendants the jinn or our descendants the human it doesn't matter because the quran defines for us that there are shayateen al-ins and shayateen al-jinn so the shaitan is a whole mark for the curse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What happens to shaitan when Allah cursed him? He's done. He's finished. Does he have a chance for tawbah? Shaitan. No. Because he defied Allah and he cut the spiritual cord between him and Allah. Can a human being be so deviant and still Repent and correct? Yes. The gate for Tawbah is open 24 7. 
we've cited and mentioned the hadith before in which the Prophet وسلم, says Allah extends his hands open by the night for those who have committed sins in the day to repent and he extends his hand by the day for those who have committed sins by night to repent and this is continuous until the sun rises from the west but does this mean that every human being will get a chance to make tawbah that is not guaranteed that's not guaranteed the only guarantee that we have is if we make tawbah and meet the conditions of tawbah Allah will accept our repentance and will help us going back and staying on the straight path so this ayah defines those parameters and it gives us the guidelines that we should respect you know when America and Russia and China start to fight and they set red lines right and when they set red lines everybody shivers because we don't know if nukes are going to fly what about the red lines that Allah sets shouldn't we all respect those we should as believers we should so when we are taught by Allah when we ask him for guidance to the straight path we are required to exclude the path of those who have been cursed and the path of those who have gone astray so if we are asking him to steer us away from those two deviant paths then why shouldn't we steer ourselves away from these paths one way the Quran tells us that we must do to protect ourselves from those deviations Allah SWT tells even the Prophet وسلم, and he is the best of companions to have definitely and Allah is telling him وَاصْبِرْ نَفْسَكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَدَاتِ وَالْعَشِي يُرِيدُونَ وَجْهَهُ does Prophet Muhammad need companions to help him stay on the straight path? No, he doesn't. He is supported by Allah directly. He is the one who receives the guidance from Allah to deliver to us. But Allah is setting him as our example. Al-Uswa Al-Hasana. The best exemplary model is him. So he's telling him, in fact, he's telling us by telling him to stick to those who remember Allah by the early day time and by the evening. To remember Allah by the day, early day time and by the evening. What does this mean? Does it mean that we only stick with people who are doing adhkar 24-7? No but people who remember Allah whose conscience is alive whose relationship with Allah matters for them it keeps them alert why? because these can become our support system if we forget they remind us if we slip they pick us up if we fall they help us recover if we stray they pull us back to the straight path those are the people that Allah is telling even the Prophet not only to stick with them but he says وَلَا تَعَدُ عَيْنَاكَ عَنْهُمْ don't you even turn your eyes away from them and this remark is very central if we want to benefit from those instructions in that when Allah says, don't turn your eyes away from them because where our eyes go, our imaginations go. Where our eyes go, 
our desires, positive or negative, go. Where your eyes go, your head goes. Where your head goes, your heart goes. This is why it is prohibited in Salah to look right or look left. Look straight down to your prostration point so that you are not self-distracting. Because if you keep your eyes rolling, your head will never be focused on the prayer. So when he says, don't you turn your eyes away from them, it is to tell us it takes struggle against your desire to see everything, to hear everything, to learn everything that's going on, because all of these can become your distractions. So where the ayah says, Sirat al-Ladina an'amta alayhim, it also is clearly, even implicitly, is telling us people are divided in the eyes of Allah between a group that He has blessed. An'amta alayhim. Who are those? An-Nabiyyin, was Siddiqeen, was Shuhada, was Salihin. Those are the blessed ones. And we're asking him to guide us to that path. Because if we want to be with them, we have to follow the path they follow, which is called the straight path. Okay? This is the first parameter. The second parameter, غير المغضوب عليهم. The path of those that you have not sent your wrath upon those who did not displease you so much that you've cursed out of your mercy. The third parameter is nor those who have gone astray. So this is the last ayah of Surah Al-Fatiha and in practical application of this ayah a believer should feel like traveling and having to keep in his or her lane, the straight path, 24-7. For a simple reason that we all believe in, we don't know when the death comes. Am I going to be on the straight path at that time or am I going to be out of track, out of the straight path? اللهم أحينا مسلمين وتوفنا مسلمين وألحقنا بالصالحين واحفظنا على سراتك المستقيم اللهم آمين So the word آمين is not part of الفاتحة The word آمين is a dua When we ask Allah سبحانه وتعالى Oh Allah respond to our prayer Accept our prayer Give us what we're asking for So before we move to Surah Al-Baqarah, which we will do in a few minutes, I would like to take any question because Surah Al-Fatiha is very influential in our daily life. So I would like to take some of your questions, please. As-Salah furidat fi Makkah fi al-aam al-sabi' min al-ba'tha During the Isra and Mi'raj. So the Fatiha is a Makki Surah. So during Makki... Okay, the question is, if this Surah is sent down in Mecca, and it is seeking that we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us away from the path of those who have been cursed and those who have gone astray. And the brother is interpreting this to mean Al-Yahud and Al-Nasara. Right? This is what a scholar says. No, no, I understand. Yeah. I understand. The scholars of Tafsir, they say, al la sabab the, the bottom line is, if the words of the ayah are general, we should not exclude their generosity, their generality, 
for the sake of the occasion or the reference that some people interpret them as. This is one point. So the ayah says, غير المغضوب عليهم Whoever they may be. ولا الضالين Whoever they may be. Past, present, and future. This is one point. The second is, the ayah is not saying, Oh Allah, protect us from them. This is not the issue. So, if they were living together, right, your question would have been quite valid. If the ayah is doing that, but they are saying, do not let us go through the path of people that you've cursed. Right? It is not invoking even his curse on anybody. It is saying people that you have cursed, people who have gone astray, those are out of the straight path. Keep us on the straight path and don't allow us to go to their path. But, you know, logically... Wait. Sorry. No, sorry. no, wait. <laughs> Any sentence that follows another sentence, starting with but, it erases what came before to replace it with something better or something alternative explanation. So give me a but. Yeah, you know, it makes sense to, to define these uh, asterisk people, define those who are cursed. So probably the same question comes to my mind. I could have asked Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, okay, who are those people? So I choose, you know, if we have a uswa for any kind of description, that's easy to, to, to just, you know, say, okay, these were the people, you know, people of Samud, people of Nuh, people of Lut, these are the peoples, you know, they had a lot of these uh, behaviors that cause Allah to... There them. are other ayat that do this function, that define, saying, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, la takunu kalladheena qalu this and this and this and this and don't be like those who did this and this and this and this so there are other ayat that does this so where the ayat are specific we take it where the ayah is general okay i should not limit it without reason to limit it okay because when we limit it, it makes it as if there is nobody ever who has been cursed but the two groups that the Prophet spoke about in the hadith. So there is a hadith about it? Yes, there is a hadith. And you agree with the hadith, of course. Huh? So you agree with the hadith? Would I ever not agree with the hadith? If it is authentic, I do. <laughs> Why should not? The point is, where the ayah is general, we should not limit it. Where the ayah is specific, we should take it for what it says. So the purpose that you want to use this ayah to serve is served in other ayat. Where Allah, for example, says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu. إن تطيعوا فريقا من الذين أوتوا الكتاب يردوكم بعد إيمانكم كافرين. If you follow some groups of the people of the book, they will turn you into kuffar after you believe. This is obvious, right? So why should I take this text and imply it on this ayah? When this ayah is general, and when I seek the straight path, Allah found it fit to speak in general terms about all else. الَّذِينَ كَذَا وَالَّذِينَ كَذَا That's it. Does it cover them? Of course it does. Yeah. So the fact that they were not in, Med in Mecca itself is really kind of like irrelevant to the request here. Yeah. 
Any other question? Yes. So you don't agree with the very common interpretation that Yahud and Nasara are not the same? Did I say I disagree with the interpretation? It was not clear. So. Because I spoke about it last time. <laughs> and in the discussion, I mentioned the hadith. He did not. I mentioned the hadith. So what was not clear? So they are. They are the the of course. The Qur'an spoke to that at length. لَقَدْ كَفَرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ ثَالِثُ ثَلَاثَةً لَقَدْ كَفَرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الْمَسِيحُ عِيْسَ بْنُ مَرِيمُ يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِنْ تُطِيعُوا فَرِيقَ إِنْ تُطِيعُوا الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا يَرُدُّوكُمْ عَلَى أَعْقَابِكُمْ فَتَنْقَلِبُوا كَافِرِينَ I said there are ayat that serve that purpose specifically. So I don't need to use this ayah for Just that purpose. Right. Sure. Sorry, if, if hadith mm -hmm. is emphasizing on it, huh? if the hadith is specifically defining it and the scholars also pointing towards it, and you are not actually uh, saying or maybe favoring it, it means you either disagree with the... No, I'm scholars. saying what the ayah is saying. The ayah is broader than, which means the Prophet ﷺ could have defined these two groups just because they are close. They do business with them, they travel and they find them on their way to uh, Syria, Palestine and all of this Sham area, right? So even though they were in Medina, but they were not completely isolated. <laughs> Remember, uh, what's his name? Waraqa ibn Nufil, the cousin of Khadija radiallahu anhu wa was a Christian minister, right? And he was learned about the Bible. And he was living in Mecca. So the blanket exclusion of the Jews or the Christians from presence in Mecca is not 100% accurate. You see what I'm saying? So the Prophet could have used them as an example of groups that have violated their covenants with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and as such they ran out of the straight path. So he gave them as an example. But when anybody in any interpretation says because he named them so those are the, 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 the impediment of the ayah, I would say it could have been mentioned as an example. Because the Quran does not shy from saying, stay away from people who insult your faith, they mock your prayer, they mock your prophet, and they don't believe in the true religion. Naming exactly the people of the book. So if this ayah was meant to define them and only them, as some would understand the hadith to mean, then it would have been mentioned here, because it's mentioned elsewhere. So Allah does not shy or fear to speak. So why do we make him as if he was? Allah is never shy or afraid, okay? But when we misunderstand what the hadith is saying or imply that those are the two groups mentioned here, we are taking an example given by the Prophet and overgeneralizing it as if we are certain that we are excluding all others that nobody else meets these two criteria but these two groups. That's the caution that I'm trying to get across. What is the basis? The basis is the Prophet ﷺ says, Sallu kama ra'aytumuni salli. Did everybody get the question? No. no just he is saying, why do we recite Al-Fatiha only? in the last 
in the third and fourth rak'ah, while we recite Al-Fatiha and some other surah or ayat with it in the first two rak'ah. The answer is, he says, on what basis do we do this? And the basis is the guidance of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says, Pray as you have seen me praying. And this is how he prayed. So we're following him. Yes. Okay. Good. Any other question about Al-Fatiha or any ayah of Al-Fatiha? Okay, should we move? What is the last request before we get to Surah Al-Baqarah? What is the last request we requested from Allah in Surah Al-Fatiha? We told Allah, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدْ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ Then what did we ask Him? إِهْدِنَا <laughs> So, the second ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah answers this request. So you ask Allah, you tell him, guide us. The second ayah of Surah Al-Baqarah says, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ هُدًا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ and in this is a huge sign if we are to pay attention that as Allah answers us immediately after we request it, right? And he taught us to set the conditions and the parameters of his guidance and his straight path that he answers our prayer immediately by telling us, you're asking for guidance, look nowhere but this book. Let us start Surah Al-Baqarah from the beginning. The third ayah of Baqarah. The third ayah of Baqarah also talks about the same time. Third ayah of Baqarah. No, no, the second ayah is the one that says, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ هُدًا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ Hudan lil muttaqin is the answer to uh, This is an extended definition of al muttaqin But the guidance request in Surah Al-Fatiha is answered in the second ayah of Surah Al-Baqarah. So let us go from the beginning. Surah Al-Baqarah, as we all notice, like every other surah in the Qur'an, would start with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And as we discussed this in the beginning of Al-Fatiha, that Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is considered a separating mark for a new surah to separate it from the previous surah. Except in Surah Al-Tawbah, that many scholars would say it is not separable from Surah Al-Anfal. Okay? And some others say it doesn't have Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim because it started off with breaking away the commitment and the covenant that the Muslims have made with the people of Quraysh because they broke the agreement. The Qurayshites, they broke the agreement so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Muslims the freedom to break away from that agreement because they attacked the, uh, the Khuza'a tribe which was allied with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And uh, by such Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Bara'atun min Allahi wa rasooli ila alladheena ahadtum min al-mushrikeen that you are free of the covenant, the agreement you have made with the mushrikeen of Mecca. So this surah does not start with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. But in Surah Al-Naml, 
إنه من سليمان وإنه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم so there is بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم in the Quran to make up for the missing بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم in the beginning of Surah At-Tawbah but that's not our subject our subject is that بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم is a separating uh, invocation that before we start as we said the whole Quran starts with بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم so we invoke the name of Allah in the beginning of the Quran and in the beginning of every surah thereafter okay except for surah at-tawbah then the first three letters alif lam mim with which surah al-baqarah starts off the the most prevalent explanation is that those separate letters that do not constitute a word okay because words are made out of letters and in any language letters make a word and words make the sentence right likewise in arabic so if you would notice almost in every surah that starts with any of those separate letters that do not constitute a word you will find the following ayah maximum the second ayah after it will immediately be talking about the book alif lam mim dhalika al kitab alif lam mim allahu la ilaha illa huwa al hayyu al qayyum immediately after نزل عليك الكتاب اوكي قاف والقران المجيد صاد والقران ذي الذكر حميم والقران الكريم ياسين والقران الحكيم so every time those letters are used as a preface entry to the surah after them comes the mentioning of the book whether by name like wal quran or al kitab or inna anzalna ilayka al kitaba bil haqq it's about the revelation of the book and this is why the most prevalent uh, explanation of those letters is that those letters from the arabic language are used to signify to the Arab laureates of the Arab community in their time and any time in history that the Quran is made of the same letters you use in your language so you poets and laureates and authors and philosophers of the Arabic language and the Arabic culture and all of this if you deny that this is from Allah you think that muhammad concocted it made it up or put it together you are better in language than he is make it bring something like it this is the most prevalent uh, opinion or explanation that these letters signify the miraculous nature of the quran that nobody no matter how good in the language they have been and they are known for being great in the language no one could bring anything like it and we will come to the ayah uh, in in the second page of the third page of the surah that talks about this issue in some details so alif lam mim you could also uh, probably read into it some other things other than what the scholars might have said and i'm not saying this is the only way to see it i'm not saying this is the interpretation i'm saying these are three letters and they are repeated in more than one place alif lam and mim they are repeated in more than one place those three letters if you turn them into a word what would this word be alif with a hamza lam and mim 
alam, right? And if you switch the letters between the meme and the lam, you switch the meme and the lam in place of each other, it becomes amal. So there is alam, which is pain. There is amal, which is hope, right? How about if you switch the meme and the hamza in place of each other, the meme and the alif? Huh? Ma'al. Right? Ma'al, which means fate. Fate. Fate, F A T E. Fate, not faith. Faith. Fate. 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 Fate means ma'al. Okay? Type. What did we do by shifting the letters? We're trying to read into those three letters that do not connect with each other. If we connect them, they can give us meaning. They can give us meaning. That this life in which we live, our fate runs in between our pain and our hope. This life is full of pain and it's also full of hope, right? If you take the right dose of hope and the right dose of pain and mix it together, you are traveling towards a good fate. If you get desperate because of pain and you forget hope, you doom yourself and your fate. Don't listen to the last part, it's just... I tend to digress sometimes, out of line, but this is some idea that I thought may help somebody remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he put these words where it belongs, in the beginning of the Qur'an, definitely when we ask him to guide us to the straight path, because we know the straight path takes us to paradise, and it starts off with alif, lam, mim, we need to think, why those letters, why they didn't start off with sad, sad or qaf, symbolically for the Qur'an, for example, right? Or sad, for sadiq or sidq, right? What about hameen? Haq mubin. Could it not be? It could be. What I'm saying is, this is my digression, forget it. If you want, throw it on the side. But let us go to the text as is. The Qur'an here starts us off by saying ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ Somebody may ask, why doesn't it say هَذَا الْكِتَابُ Why does it say ذَلِكَ ذَلِكَ اسم موصول للبعيد هذا اسم إشارة للقريب Okay Allah in other places says إن هذا القرآن يهدي للتي هي أقوى Right? So he used هذا But why here he is using ذلك This uh, surah was revealed in Medina Almost in the beginning of the Medina era and People in Medina were talking about the Qur'an that was given to a man who says he is a prophet from God in Mecca. So it is ذَلِكَ kitab, ذَلِكَ prophet. Okay? So the word here expresses this book that comes from high, ذَلِكَ. ذَلِكَ kitab is the same as it was in the Lawh al-Mahfuz, Thalik. 
it is not haza because if we were to limit it only to haza it assumes several things but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to appreciate yes the book was far and he even tells the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam وَمَا كُنْتَ تَدْرِي مَا كُنْتَ تَدْرِي مَا الْكِتَابُ وَلَا الْإِيمَانِ You Muhammad was not aware of what the Quran is or what faith is وَلَكِنْ جَعَلْنَاهُ نُورًا نَهْدِي بِهِ مَنْ نَشَاءُ مِنْ عِبَادِنَا We have made it light to guide those that we want to guide among our servants so the word ذلك is referring to the book that you are talking about is here now ذلك الكتاب means that that book that you're referring to is now here and it is yours and it is yours to examine it is yours to study it is yours if you like to have guidance ذلك الكتاب and before it offers the guidance it removes any doubt about its truthfulness truthfulness it is completion or its perfect nature a book that comes from Allah is his word his word carries his holy attributes and holy names as he is perfect his word is perfect so before he starts to talk about the book, he describes the book. He says, that book that you are talking about is right here with you right now in Medina and the Prophet is in Medina and this book has no doubt in it. Which means for 13 years before the Prophet had come, he already had challenged the people in Mecca to bring anything like it bring one surah bring ten surah bring anything like it and they couldn't and Mecca was the center of culture and language and poetry and competition and trade and business and society and families and marriages Mecca was the center for Arabia as it is the center of the world, geographically speaking. So here is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so that we receive the book with a clean open heart and to close the gate for the shaitan creeping in with doubts and suspicions from the outside it says, لا ريب فيه. There is no doubt in it. Which means it's full it's complete, it is not missing anything that should have been there so that somebody would add it and it, it doesn't have anything extra or more than what needed to be there لا ريب في لا ريب في also emphasizes the fact that every ayah, every word in the Quran is meant as is what does this mean? And what does it do? It means what it says. There is no doubt in any word. There is no doubt in any ayah. And what it practically means is do not accept doubts because any doubt that you throw at the Quran, Imam Ali describes this book saying, وَلَا يَخْلَقُ عَلَى كَثْرَةِ الرَّدِّ Throw any doubt at the Quran, it will answer it. It will answer it. Bring any question to the Quran. The Quran is never shy from answering any claim. Even if it is the worst or falsest of claims, the Quran welcomes any claim. But here the Quran is talking to the believers. So to start with, it is telling us, you come to the Quran, rest assured. You know when when you get, um, I hate to use human examples, but this is the closest way that comes to my head now, that when you get a, any commodity, 
stamped with the stamp of the original manufacturer. But then it says, made in China. Do you think that this is original? Right? Okay. Likewise, the stamp that the Quran is putting is that this is the book. Finished. The word the book excludes whatever came in any previous books. If they don't agree, then this is the book, which means the ultimate book, the final book, the only pure book of revelation that ever came from heaven. So the word the book, ذلك الكتاب, this article al is very central, very important. ذلك الكتاب, then it is described as لا ريب فيه لا here is a negating لا okay it is a negation of any doubt who is certifying this book it's Allah do you have a better certificate than this does any book of the previous books come with this kind of certification Sorry, I will have to digress to answer this question. No. All of the previous books, as they stand in our hands today, they are authored by people who never saw the prophets themselves. The authors of all the Gospels have never seen Isa. The authors of the Old Testament have never seen Moses. Right? Not only that, none of the authors claimed openly that this came to him as a revelation from Allah or even an inspiration from Allah. In fact, the most open one among all of the writers of the Gospels said that it is his investigation of the previous books that were written before his. The last writer was Luke or Luca, and he put this in his first verse, in the first chapter of Luke. He's not saying revelation or inspiration, he's saying that's my investigation. And the purpose was to put the events that happened in the past in orderly fashion. That's his writing. You read it in the first ayah, in the first chapter of Luke. Definitely, the rest also do not claim that this is revelation or inspiration. But here is Allah telling us what this book is and in what way it is different and why it deserves the title the book which means the ultimate the ultimate book ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه as you look at the word ريب and the word فيه you will find three dots on the back and three dots on the hat, Rayba, Fihi. These are called Alamat al Ta'anuq, which means if you stop at one, you don't stop at the other. Meaning, you either read it, Thalika al Kitabu la Rayba, and then you stop and say, Fihi huda lil muttaqi. Or you say, Thalika al Kitabu la Rayba Fihi. Hudan lil muttaqi. Okay, so you don't skim over both. You have, if you stop at one, you don't stop at the other. Okay, and it does have two meanings in that context. If you say, ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدن للمتقين, then فيه هدن للمتقين. Becomes 
the jawab or the sentence which constitutes the khabar of the sentence. ذلك الكتاب what لا ريب فيه. Okay. If you stop at لا ريب then at all ذلك الكتاب لا ريب and then you start a new sentence and say فيه هدى للمتقين. Then فيه هدى للمتقين becomes the khabar for the beginning of the sentence ذلك الكتاب. Okay. So in both ways it is it is true both ways like if you say ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه it is true if you say ذلك الكتاب لا ريب which means there is no doubt is guidance for المتقين that also is true so the two meanings are true and they are embedded that's why you could read it this way and you could read it this way why do most scholars prefer to read ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه and then هدى للمتقين it is because it is a stronger meaning in the sense that it negates doubt in the book and then it confirms that that book as a whole is guidance not just فيه it's not just has hudan lil muttaqin it is hudan lil muttaqin you see the difference i hope i'm not missing anybody or confusing anyone am i yes i am confusing no huh? clear so dhalik al kitab la rayba fihi hudan lil muttaqin hudan as we explained means guidance and as we mentioned before, this ayah answers our request in Al-Fatiha when we say, Ihdina Sirat al mustaqim Allah is telling us, if you want your prayer answered, this book will give you the guidance you're seeking. It is not that it is only in this book that you're, the guidance you're looking for, it also is that the entire book is guidance from beginning to end and that confirms what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi used to say خذوه كله أو تركوه كله don't pick and choose when it comes to Allah's word don't pick and choose I like it when you speak about my rights but when the Quran speaks about my wife's rights I don't like it. That is not Islam. Islam is to love Allah, accept His guidance, whether it speaks for what you think is for you or for someone else. You accept it as a whole. So as it says, Al-Kitab as a whole is guidance. lil muttaqin inshallah, if we live for next week, we'll continue. سبحانك اللهم وحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك